Just before we get started with today's video, I do want to thank the YouTube channel JTV for sponsoring this video. If you enjoy educational content like this, I really think you'll enjoy their channel, which is also educational, just in the geology and gemology space. On their channel, they explore hidden gems from movies and TV shows and deep dive into particular gemstones. Check it out through the link in the description below and let's get into it. Born on August 22, 1930, in Temple, Texas, Forrest Fenn did not begin his life wealthy, with his father working to support his family via a job as a principal at a local high school. Things would change, however, during the latter half of his life thanks to a love of exploring and collecting various artifacts. His first such object was a simple arrowhead he found when he was nine years old, something he still has to this day, some eight decades later. Said Fenn, I was exhilarated, and it started me on a lifelong adventure of discovering and collecting things. After finishing school, Fenn decided to do a little exploring on the government's dime, joining the US Air Force in 1950 and traveling the world. Ultimately rising to the rank of major as well as flying a remarkable 328 combat missions in one year during Vietnam, he used his free time while in the service to search for artifacts wherever he was. Among many other finds, during his time in the Air Force, he reportedly discovered such things as a spearhead in the Sahara Desert dated to around the 6th century BC and even a jar still filled with olive oil from ancient Rome. When he finally retired from the service, he decided to see if he could make a career out of his hobby, opening a shop, Fen Galleries with his wife and a business partner, Rex Arrowsmith, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The business ultimately became extremely successful, apparently grossing a whopping $6 million per year in sales at its peak. Fast forwarding almost two decades, in 1987, Fenn's father died of pancreatic cancer. Things got worse the next year when Fenn himself was diagnosed with kidney cancer. During treatment, his doctors told him there was about an 80% chance of his cancer becoming terminal within just a few years. And so it was that with more money and valuable objects than anyone in his family would need when he was gone, he decided that he'd like to use some of his artifacts to inspire people to get out of their homes and go exploring. As he noted a couple of decades later in an interview with the Albuquerque Journal in 2013, I'm trying to get fathers and mothers to go out into the countryside with their children. I want them to get away from the house and away from the TV and texting. His method for doing this was, in 1990, to purchase an approximately 800-year-old bronze chest for about $25,000 about $48,000 today, and then place inside of it a slew of valuables, including rubies, sapphires, diamonds, and emeralds, several antique items, including pre-Columbian gold figures, a 2,000-year-old necklace, a Spanish ring covered in gems from the 17th century, well over 100 gold nuggets of various sizes, 256 gold coins, and finally, an autobiography of himself, written in ultra-small print and encased in a sealed jar. To ensure it could be readily read by the discoverer, he helpfully also included a magnifying glass. Then done, his first idea was simply to wait until he was near death, then leave behind a series of clues to a spot that he had picked to go and die, lying next to his treasure chest. However, fortunately for him, he survived his cancer, though he would later quip that surviving the cancer ruined the story. Now with more life in him, instead of going through with the plan, he simply placed the treasure chest and its valuable contents in his personal vault, where it sat, waiting for his cancer to come back so that he could execute his plan. Two decades later, and no cancer returning at the age of 80 in 2010, he figured it was time to put his version of the plan into motion anyway. Thus, he drove somewhere in the Rockies between Santa Fe, New Mexico and the border of Canada. He got out of his car and he lugged the chest some unknown distance. From here, it's not clear whether he buried it or simply left it on the surface to be discovered. Whatever he did after driving home, he announced what he'd done shortly thereafter in his self-published autobiography called The Thrill of the Chase, a memoir. Given this was initially just sold in a bookstore in Santa Fe, and he doesn't seem to have otherwise too widely promoted what he'd done beyond locals, as you might imagine, little notice was given at first. Things all changed, however, when an in-flight magazine, who had stumbled on the story, who knows how, decided to feature it. A Today's Show producer ultimately read this and decided it would make good fodder for their show in 2013. Not long after this, the story exploded across the news wires and treasure hunters the world over swarmed to the Rockies to find the chest. Since then, an estimated few hundred thousand people have gone looking for Fenn's treasure. Some even have regular meetups in the Rockies each year to sit around campfires and enjoy each other's company while sharing hypotheses of where the treasure might be. 
Not always wrong, according to Fenn, a few who have emailed him of where they looked have even come within a couple of hundred feet of it. This implies that they probably correctly identified the starting points that he gives in the clues that we'll get into shortly. But nobody has found it yet. Worse, in the process of searching, at least four people to date have lost their lives. One Jeff Murphy died after falling down a steep slope in Yellowstone. In another case, a past Paris Wallace somehow got swept away in the Rio Grande during his search. In another instance, one Eric Ashby was rafting in Colorado during his search when he drowned. In his case, Ashby apparently specifically moved to Colorado the previous year to devote himself to finding the treasure. Finally, Randy Bilio, who retired from his job as a mechanic to search for the treasure, Full time was found along the Rio Grande, though it isn't clear how he died, other than the temperatures were below freezing at the time he was searching. For whatever it's worth, it's also been claimed by Billio's ex wife Linda that a family of unnamed individuals reached out to her to try and offer their condolences and revealed that their loved one had also died searching, but that they had chosen not to make the information public. On top of that, it's also mentioned that Jeff Schulz, who died while hiking in Arizona in 2016, was searching for the treasure, though nothing in his family's memorial to him and Facebook posts seem to mention any such connection, despite it being widely reported. Whatever the case, in response to these deaths, Fenn, who actually rented a helicopter to help search for Billio when he went missing, continually reiterates that searchers need to remember the treasure is not in a dangerous place. I was 80 when I hid it. Don't look anywhere where an 80-year-old man can't put something. I'm not that fit. I can't climb 14,000 feet. This fact also has many speculating that from the starting point where he exited the vehicle to where the chest is might only be a couple of hundred feet given the 42 pounds that the chest apparently weighed. Whatever the case, because of the deaths and some people's reported obsession with finding the treasure with a handful of people even bankrupting themselves in the search, Fenn has been asked by certain authorities to retrieve the chest and call off the hunt. This is a request Fenn refuses to grant, noting the overall benefits to hundreds of thousands who've gone on a real treasure hunt in the wilderness. He further states, I regret that some treasure hunters have invested more in the search than they could afford, although those numbers are small. I also regret that several people have become lost in the Winter Mountains. I have said many times that no one should extend themselves beyond their comfort zone physically or financially. And as for the addicted, he states this is unavoidable with any activity, in the same way gold miners, gamblers, hunters, and baseball fans become addicted. Naturally, others have claimed it's all one big hoax, such as the aforementioned Linda Billio. Fenn is adamant, however, that it is not, and that he really did put the treasure chest somewhere in the Rockies. As for proof, he offers none but his word. That said, for whatever it's worth, a few of his friends have come forward and stated that they saw the chest in his vault. For example, a longtime friend of his, noted author Douglas Preston, states that he saw the chest and the items, and that, as far as proof goes, there's no proof. It's hard to prove a negative. The negative is that the chest is gone. It's not in his house, and it's not in his vault. And also, knowing Forrest for as long as I have, I can absolutely say with 100% confidence that he would never pull off a hoax. I'm absolutely sure that he hid that treasure chest. So, the question now becomes, well, where is it? As for the main set of clues Fenn has given, they are as follows. As I have gone alone in there, and with my treasures bold, I can keep my secret where, and hint at riches new and old. Begin it where warm waters halt, and take it in the canyon down, not far, but too far to walk. Put it in below the home of Brown. From there, it's no place for the meek. The end is ever drawing nigh. There'll be no paddle up your creek, just heavy loads and water high. If you've been wise and found the blaze, look quickly down your quest to cease. But tarry scant with marvel gaze. Just take the chest and go in peace. So why is it that I must go and leave my trove for all to seek? The answers I already know. I've done it, tired and now I'm weak. So hear me all, and listen good. Your effort will be worth the cold. If you are brave and in the wood, I give you title to the gold." Beyond that, he's also mentioned in his autobiography that it is in the mountains somewhere north of Santa Fe. It's also known that the treasure is not in any cemetery or grave. Apparently, some people were beginning to dig up graves, convinced that he left it in one, nor on his property or any of his friends. The latter one came out because people kept digging up his and his friends' properties. He also states that it's not under any man-made structure nor in a mine. Finally, in 2015, he stated at a certain point that it was wet at the time and surrounded by wonderful smells of pine needles or pinion nuts or sagebush. 
In the end, apparently achieving his goal, since the treasure was allegedly placed, many thousands have used it as an inspiration for a fun family vacation in beautiful areas, in most cases seemingly little upset about not actually finding the treasure. As Fenn himself states, even for those who don't find it, the adventure is the greatest treasure. Seemingly concurring, one retired searcher, Cynthia Meacham, has taken over 60 trips in the wilderness to try and find it, stating, You go out, you look, you don't find it, you come back home, you go through your clues again, your solves again, and you think, where did I go wrong? And you go out, and you do it again. And I have actually seen some of the most spectacular scenery because of this that I ever would have seen. Of course, for one lucky individual, someday they might just walk away with a literal rather than figurative treasure, which is the hope of Fenn, who states that given the number of people having correctly followed the clues to a point and come so close, he expects someone will find it soon. However, with him now at 89 years old, he may not live to see the day. And if you're now wondering, Fenn has also stated that he is the only one who knows the treasure chest's location, and he has left no definitive record of its whereabouts other than the already revealed clues. And now for a bonus fact. Speaking of buried treasure, a back injury and a recommendation by his doctors to take frequent walks saw one Kevin Hillier of Australia deciding to use the time more productively than just exercise, taking strolls through former gold fields with a metal detector. Broke, one night, he dreamed he'd found an endless gold nugget that was so big that it could not be dug out of the ground. The next morning, he drew a picture depicting his dream on a piece of paper and had his friend Russell sign it as a witness for some odd reason. Whether he made that part up, it was indeed coincidence from him having gold on his brain, or indeed prophetic, on September 26, 1980, the dream would come true. After lunch, Kevin and his wife, Bip, were detecting in opposite directions when Kevin screamed. Rushing to him, Bip found her husband on the ground, sobbing while kneeling in front of the tip of a gold nugget that couldn't be pried from the ground directly. As a result, they began to dig and dig and dig until they finally reached the bottom. Lifting it up, they realized what they'd found was history. Weighing an astonishing 27.2 kilograms, nearly 60 pounds, it was the largest gold nugget ever found by a hand metal detector and the second largest discovered in Australia in the 20th century. In a recent interview, Bip claims that the couple had had some heavenly intervention. People will say it was all coincidence and that's fine. But that's my father up there, and he's interested in everything we do. To them, the rock looked like a hand making a blessing, so Bip and Kevin named the gold rock the Hand of Faith. Scared to tell anyone, they rushed it home and soaked the 60-pound chunk in the sink. The kids all helped to clean it with toothbrushes. That night, the family slept as the gold sat in a kiddie pool under the parents' bed. After a few days' debate about what to do, they decided to hand the rock over to a trusted friend to take it back to Melbourne for a delivery to the government. A few days later, at a televised press conference, Victorian Premier Dirk Hammer announced the discovery. However, the Hilliers were not there. They were holed up in a motel room watching the press conference on television, refusing to be identified. Said one of the Hillier kids, even for years afterwards, we kids never brought it up. It took several months for the nugget to sell. According to Bib, this was the government's fault and caused the nugget to dip in value as the hype died down a bit. But finally, in early February of 1981, with the help of Kovacs Gems and Minerals, it was sold to the appropriately named Golden Nugget Casino in Las Vegas for about a million dollars, which is approximately $2.7 million today. And while speaking of gems, this channel, as I mentioned at the beginning, it was sponsored by the YouTube channel JTV. If you're interested in learning more about gemstones and the science behind them, please do check them out. There is a link below. As I said before, it's about all things gemstones, like how one might make real life vibranium or how geodes are formed. The recent video is all about catacomb saints, which are gemstone encrusted skeletons. So I encourage you to check it out. Let them know that I sent you in the comments on their video. There is a link below. And as always, thank you for watching.